So a couple quick corrections. Uh, in my bio, it should say church and not churches, because this is the first church that I've actually uh, done a debate in or dialectical discussion. Uh, and also what it doesn't say is that I was a Southern Baptist for more than 25 years. So I, I, don't, I don't know how relevant that is, but it does give people some perspective. Um, thanks for having me and thanks for showing up. I really appreciate this and thank you to Israel. I thought we, uh, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. And this is the kind of thing that I live for. And there are people who have commented that I seem to be different from some of the other atheists that they've seen or interacted with. And in some respects that may be true and in others it's, I think it's just a matter of perception. When I hear people coming up to give the sermons during, over the course of this lectureship, when I hear them representing the atheist position, it's almost never, at least not entirely consistent with my own. The question tonight is, is God man-made? And it probably won't surprise anyone who was here last night that my answer begins with, I don't know. But it does end a little bit differently. I don't know, but I think that that's the case. And so I'll make that case, but first we need to address the burden of proof a bit more because there's some people who've expressed frustration, particularly with last night. Uh, some seem to think that we're pitting two competing ideas here, one idea being God exists and the other one is that God doesn't exist. And as I tried to point out last night, that's not the proposition that I'm here to defend. Um, and it's frustrated some that I'm quick to respond with, I don't know. I, that's the honest answer, and it's the one that encourages us to go out and find the right answer. In truth, the two competing ideas here are more akin to there's good reason to believe that God exists, and I don't agree with that, or I don't agree that we can reasonably reach that conclusion. And late this afternoon, the challenge went out, where is the evidence from the atheists which disproves the Bible? And as I told Joshua after he had raised it, that is a shifting of the burden of proof, that the Bible doesn't, isn't just true. Oops, sorry. Uh, yes. The Bible isn't just true right up until the point somebody disproves it. But there are people who have engaged in um, challenges to the Bible, questions about the Bible, pointing out what they see as, as contradictions. I'll get to some of that in a little bit. But on the subject of the burden of proof, I used a gumball analogy last night, um, which I think made it clear to some. And I also talked about whether you should believe something until it's proved false, or whether you should reserve belief until such time it's been demonstrated is true, and why I support the latter. Because if you believe something until it's proved false, you're going to be believing competing ideas and things that are necessarily false. And the fact that someone can't prove that a particular claim is false doesn't mean that the claim is true. And even if I fail to convince you that God is man-made or whatever the proposition may be, that doesn't mean that God is real. Those are propositions that must stand or fall on their own merits and on the basis of the evidence supporting them. This idea that if you can't prove me wrong, I'm right, is simply not the way we demonstrate the truth of things. When we listen to the sermons, they're very convincing, especially if you already believe, and it's very difficult to spot fallacies because picking out fallacies is difficult in conversational discussions, and it's much easier when something is formatted as a proper logical syllogism. And I wish I had time to address, and I'm sorry that this may appear insulting to some people, the many, many, many fallacies that I've heard over the last couple of days, because I think it would be helpful. There's so much content, and I, you know, watch, watch the uh, DVDs that they're being recorded, um, and try to take the claims and put them into a syllogism. Do some research if you don't understand about logical syllogisms. I'm not trying to push anything over anybody's head. Um, I'm not necessarily smarter than anybody, uh, although, although I've read and studied quite a bit. If you made a list of every god that has ever been claimed to exist, it would cover the walls inside of here, which would be kind of sacrilegious, I, I agree. But there are lots of them. And those are just named gods that people have proposed that, it, that they'd exist. And by and large, if you asked most people, they would look at all of those gods and say that they're man-made, except for the one that they believe in. My God is not man-made, my God is real. These others are man-made. Now there may be other explanations that all these other gods exist as non-gods or that these are demons fooling people, but the concepts generally we would identify as these are man-made, this is a false god, the flying spaghetti monster, Thor. You know, obviously somebody had a failure in reasoning, needed an explanation, put Thor in there and you're done. 
The interesting thing is that for any given God on that list, there are many different believers in that God who each have a different God concept in their head. Their internal model of that God is going to be different. For example, the biblical God is cited by many as their God, but even for that category that, that, that appears to be one God, there are many different God concepts, which is why you can have so many different Christian denominations or denominations that identify as Christian, and why you can have different God concepts even within the Church of Christ or the Baptists, and why you end up with Southern Baptists and Southern Baptists of 1893 and you know, the Reformation of this, you know, it goes on forever. There's a really good joke from Emo Phillips in there. But it's worse than that because even when we get down to a single denomination, a single group of a denomination, a single church, a single pew, the two people sitting right there could have different God concepts in their head and most likely do. I'll get back to that point a little bit later. Given that that's the case and given that we live in a world where the the most probable determinant of what your religion is going to be is what your parents' religions were and where you were born. Not, this is not stating that they're false because you were born into it, but that's, that's just a fact. If your parents are Muslims, you're probably going to be a Muslim. Given all of that, what is the likelihood that you manage to find the one true God out of all the other man-made gods? Seems pretty low to me. More, more than that, though, we don't know how likely it is that any of them are actually true. It's possible, uh, it's, it's impossible for all of those gods to be real because they're mutually contradictory. They have different properties and different claims about them. But it is possible, so far as I can tell, that they're all false. So not only do you have to come up with the odds that you've picked the right one, but you also have to find a way to demonstrate that there is a right one and I don't know how anybody could demonstrate that. We know for a fact that men have created gods. I, mean, I, I don't even think that this is in dispute. I'd be surprised if Israel disputed it. It's one of the things that we just see. If, if not flying spaghetti monster, okay, it's not proposed as a real god by some, although they're wearing colanders on their head on their driver's licenses now, which I find to be kind of absurd. And yes, there are people who identify Jedi as their religion, but there are other man-made religions. There are other man-made gods. Now, why have men, I would say and women, but let's be honest about the history, it's mostly men doing this, created gods? What's the reason? Well, we don't have a good answer that is complete because we don't have a time machine. We can't go back and say, hmm, why'd they come up with that idea? But we can speculate and we can come up with good explanations. The most common and the ones that I find most reasonable to me are that gods are offered as a way to explain things that we don't understand and to assuage our fears of the unknown and fears of dying. Many times this weekend I've heard that the world is consistent with what we'd expect if the God of the Bible is real. I disagree, but I might have a different concept of the God of the Bible than you do. But consistency isn't surprising because if we have invented a God to serve as an explanation for what we observe, then of course what we observe is going to be consistent with that God. Otherwise, it doesn't serve any purpose as an explanation. If we don't understand how something works and we invent a God to explain how it works, it doesn't do us any good to look back at the thing that we were trying to explain and say, look, this is consistent with a God. Of course it is. That's why we manufactured the God in the first place. Consistency is irrelevant in this context. Let's not take me out of context there. It's a meaningless panacea when we invent a God that can do anything and be anything. It serves as an answer to every question and an explanation for nothing because it has no explanatory power. It's attempting to solve a mystery by appealing to a bigger mystery. And that's not the way we gain understanding about the universe. It's frustrating to hear things like, look at the trees, or the mere fact that you're standing here is evidence of God. No, it isn't. <laughs> 
It's evidence that I'm standing here. The existence of a thing is not in and of itself evidence for any specific cause. The causal link must be established and demonstrated. As we talked about a little bit about last night with design, you don't just get to call it a beaver dam, you've got to actually demonstrate it. And calling me a creation isn't it isn't true until it's been demonstrated. If I am a creation, then I'll agree, I have a creator. But until you demonstrate that that's the case, you can't just say, oh, just the fact that you're standing here is proof of God. Now, you folks love the Bible. I mean, you really love the Bible. And I don't say that in insulting, this is just awesome because last night it was the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. There's a book for that. Um, and this is probably, I would say, one of a couple of different areas where we immediately part company and it affects everything else we discuss. Because I don't find the Bible reliable. We keep hearing about how it's the most authenticated book, but that to me is meaningless because how authenticated is it? If it turns out that the most authenticated book is 1% authenticated, well then telling me it's the most authenticated book is telling me nothing. I need something more, something about how authenticated it is. How reliable is it? Israel cited 6,000 manuscripts. We don't have autographs, we don't have originals, and some of those are fragments the size of a credit card, but none of that matters. Because when we talk about authentication, the fact that the Bible gets some verifiable facts correct, some place names, some information about history, um, is utterly unremarkable and unimpressive to me. And just because it gets those facts right, doesn't mean that it also gets the facts right about the extraordinary claims that it makes. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. I'll get to David Hume in a while, who's, you know, if there's any philosopher who I, I consider the pinnacle of philosophy and modern thought, it's David Hume, and everybody should read it. Um, but, but each of the claims need their own supporting evidence. If archaeologists in 3,000 years find evidence of New York, that doesn't mean that Spider-Man was real. And I don't say that in an insulting way, it's just a way of extrapolating and, and demonstrating by analogy that just because the, some event occurred in Jerusalem that we can verify doesn't mean that the same book that tells you that story is also correct that somebody walked on water or raised people from the dead. Those are claims that require additional evidence. Um, I heard, we heard last night how miracles are done in the Church of Christ view, that we're no longer getting miracles because they were there to confirm the word, uh, which means that we don't have the epistemic justification that those people who reported the miracles had. We have to trust them. We have to trust these people who claim that they saw stuff. I can't do that. I can't trust that somebody reported, oh, I saw this amazing thing. I, I may believe that they believe it, I may, I may believe that they're sincere, but I don't believe that they've come to the correct conclusion or that they are portraying sufficient evidence. We talked about, I heard a little bit about prophecy today, and wow, there's way too much. How much time do I have? We're almost getting to 10. I'm almost to 10, wow. Um, so on prophecy, I'll just say, there's lots of disputes about prophecy, and if you want to find out why you know, talk to some Jews about why they don't accept the Messianic prophecies, et cetera, and I'll let the different doctrines dispute those things. Um, but the fact that a prediction or claim ultimately came true does not tell you why it came true. It doesn't. We had, there was an assertion today that the, the best possible, the only remaining explanation is that this was God. I don't know how we concluded that. Look at any given claim. How did you determine that it wasn't luck? Probably not. Wasn't a wild guess. Wasn't an educated guess. Especially if you're making a prediction about war, it's just a few years before the war. If there's turmoil, that seems to be kind of an educated guess. Um, we haven't ruled out time travel. I mean, everybody's gonna go, what? Time travel? Are you nuts? I don't know that it's impossible. I don't know what the explanation is for why a particular claim may or may not have come true. And when people claim that they do know why, I want to see the evidence for why that is. And if the claim is that, well, there just couldn't be any other way, I, I'm not buying it. There was some quote about Peter 
you know, professing that these were eyewitnesses and we're not just following a constructed fable. Well, of course you're going to hear that. If you believed you were following a constructed fable, you probably wouldn't believe it anymore. Uh, but nobody is going to say, you know, yeah, we are just following a constructed fable. The mere fact that somebody claims that they're not doesn't mean they're correct. It doesn't even necessarily mean that they're sincere, but I'm happy to think that they are. Hume taught us a couple of things. Revelation is necessarily first person to everybody else. It's hearsay. And it's not the same quality of evidence. He also taught us to reject the greater miracle. And he said famously that if somebody comes to me and tells me that a man was raised from the dead, I have to consider which is more likely that this individual is deceived or deceiving or that the event actually happened and I need to reject the greater miracle. There was a passage cited uh, from Deuteronomy about prophets um, and that you, you know them by their fruit, essentially another version of that. And that what, it's, what the passage actually says is uh, if somebody comes forth and prophesies in the name of God and it doesn't come to pass, then that's a false prophet. But what that passage doesn't say, which was implied and actually I think stated, is that if what they say does come to pass, that they're a true prophet. That passage doesn't say that, and it would be logically false to conclude that that's the case. We talk about eyewitnesses. Now, when it comes to the Bible, we can argue whether or not we actually have eyewitnesses or not. I don't really care, because we know that eyewitness testimony is unreliable. Um, how many people are familiar with the story of Betty and Barney Hill, who claimed to be abducted by aliens? There's some parallels to the story, and I won't get into the whole thing, but when I hear from uh, one of the common apologetics is, you know, appealing to the witness of Mary and how unrealistic it would be that if somebody were trying to deceive people that they would have a woman be the representative. And I think we could argue that if, you know, if somebody were trying to deceive about aliens in the 60s, it'd be unlikely that they'd have an interracial couple be the representatives of truth. I mean, we could maybe draw some parallels, though. But you can actually meet real people right now who will tell you their alien abduction st story. Um, they'll portray it. They seem sincere. Their stories are consistent with other people who claim to have abducted. Do we believe them? I don't. I may believe that they're sincere. I may believe that they're confused, but I don't believe the truth of the foundational premise that they're talking about. When I talk about why I don't accept the Bible, there are lots of reasons. And I've heard this weekend that it's perfect, infallible, without contradiction, and that no one has shown other size, which, otherwise, which is a shifting of the burden of proof. And yet I'll point you to the Skeptics Annotated Bible and infidels.org, which list a massive, uh, have a massive collection of listed proposed contradictions and absurdities. I don't accept all of them. I think some of them are dumb, uh, but others are more difficult. But the problem is, whenever I raise these, the response I get is very similar to the response I got last night. You just don't understand the Bible. You don't understand the Bible. The Bible properly interpreted, the Bible read correctly, the Bible understood correctly. These are the things that we get, and yet there's no demonstration of the method one would use to properly understand or interpret the Bible, apart from continuing to appeal to the Bible or saying, oh, we'll find out when it's true. That is not a methodology for determining truth, and it's the reason we have so many different denominations within Christianity and even divisions within the Church of Christ, because you think you've got the right answer, and they think they've got the right answer, and there is no demonstrated mechanism for finding out. And by the way, just pick one little doctrinal thing, the requirement of baptism for salvation. I mean, I, I, I don't know enough about what you've discussed about this, but basically, everybody who doesn't believe that, I'm presuming or they're damned, and so for thousands of years, or 1,800 years, until somebody found the right interpretation, everybody else had it wrong. No matter how sincere they were, no matter how much they were trying to promote Christ, no matter how much they were trying to encourage others to come to Christ, no matter how devout they were, they all got it wrong. And yet God didn't seem to offer any correction. And yet there came a correct interpretation by some people's minds. Men have invented gods, and some people think that theirs, theirs is the only one that wasn't invented. But we look at this scientifically. We've hooked people up to an fMRI, a way of scanning the brain, and we ask questions. And you can ask people questions. What do you think about this? And a part of the brain will light up any time they're talking about what they think. And if you say, what does Joe Blow think about this? Another part of the brain will light up in response to that question, because now, they're not thinking about what they would do. They are putting themselves in the position of some other thinking agent 
and saying, what would this person think about it? And so you can ask people these questions. What would you do about this? Boom. What would Joe do about this? Boom. Which side lights up when you ask him what God thinks? This side. The side that refers to self. That's confirmation that we each invent a God of our own creation. We have our own internal model. Does, whether or not it maps to an actual God is still an open question. Whether or not you can come up with an apologetic that says, oh, well, the reason this side lights up is because God is so intricately tuned to us that we don't even think of him as another being, and so, of course, we're thinking with ourselves. And yet, curiously, that doesn't solve a problem at all. Because what we see and what we observe is that when people think about what does God think, they're using the side of the brain that is about what they think. And that would be okay if they were consistent and in agreement, but they're not. So given the number of potential gods out there, the ones that we know were man-made, and that we don't, can't determine if any of them were in fact man-made, and the fact that each individual has their own God concept, which seems by all available evidence to consistently agree with them, which is how we end up in these disputes. My position is that the most reasonable conclusion is that gods are man-made. Are they intentional fictions constructed by people? No. I think some of them probably are. I'm not the cynical religions and gods were invented to control the masses and keep the people down and only the, the, the opium of the masses and stupid people believe this. Uh, I was a Christian for 25 years. My IQ didn't go up when I stopped believing. I don't think Christians are stupid. Otherwise, I think I was stupid. I like myself way too much to think I was stupid. But I do think I was wrong. I do think I was mistaken. And I know that I was sincere. And when I hear people talk about, was God a human invention? I don't think of it as a, an intentional machination to control or construct something. I look at it more as simple errors in thinking, simple errors in reasoning. We need an explanation for this. We can't come up with one. We don't currently have one. We are incredibly frustrated that we don't have one. Hey, wait. This God can do anything, which means we can plug it in as an explanation for anything. And the universe will be consistent with that because that's exactly why we proffered it in the first place. But my concern is with whether or not it's real. And if you start with a blank slate, if you start without any presuppositions, it's difficult, it's virtually impossible to get rid of all of your baggage. But if you try and you say, nope, I'm gonna set down the Bible and I'm not gonna begin with the assumption that it's correct, and instead, I'm going to try to prove that it's correct. Or instead, I'm going to try to explore this and then come back and find out if what the Bible had to say is consistent with what I found, that's fine. And if that's where you end up, God bless you. Uh, but I need actual evidence of a God. And as far as I can tell, the most reasonable conclusion is that we have invented gods, sometimes on purpose, sometimes accidentally, as the result of the normal way we think. Lots of appeals to common sense this weekend. Common sense is wrong, a lot. Common sense gets us into trouble. It's the reason that we rely on reason. It's the reason that we want sound epistemologies. It's the reason that when we're in a court of law trying to determine uh, whether or not a God exists, and the prosecution is claiming that the God exists, my position is not guilty. I find God not guilty of existence. Every God that's been proposed, not guilty. Doesn't mean I think they're innocent. Doesn't mean I'm asserting that there are no gods. Like I said, it's an unfalsifiable proposition. I can't prove that gods don't exist. That's not where the burden of proof rests. And I can't prove that any specific God is necessarily a man-made fiction. But I have to go with what I find most reasonable. And given the weight of the evidence from the broader world, not just appealing to one holy book or one tradition, or whether or not something happens to be consistent with reality, I have to come to the conclusion that the most reasonable position is that gods are man-made. And this is not something that I claim as an absolute certainty, which we kind of talked about absolute certainty last night. But thanks.
certainly is good to be with each of you tonight and to join Matt in this second night of discussion concerning what I consider to be the most meaningful questions of human existence. Last night, as we dealt with the question, what is more rational, an eternal God or eternal matter? I made the statement that when we think about all of the knowledge that we have accumulated over the course of existence, then man has systematized that knowledge into certain categories that we label philosophy. Philosophy is the study of wisdom, and the five basic tenets of philosophy are metaphysics, it deals with the matter of origins, epistemology that deals with how we know what we know, logic which deals with the science or the art of correct reasoning, ethics that answers the question how should we live or is there a way that we ought to live, and then aesthetics that deals with art and beauty. And I was careful to make the point that if we fail to get our metaphysics right, then everything else will be wrong. Our epistemology, our logic, our ethics, and our aesthetics. And consequently, our life will not make sense because we function based on reason. And reason's first and most profound and meaningful question is, where did I come from? If I cannot answer that question, which Mr. De La Hante has already said, I don't know, and he began today with, I don't know, then there is no way he can know how to reason. Because one's metaphysics directly affects one's epistemology. We reason from the known to the unknown. But like I said yesterday, when we think about just the very word reason or rationality or rational, it implies that we have a mind that is able to think, understand, and form judgments logically. The very word logic means that there is a particular system that involves the principles of proof and inference. And all of those operations exist within a construct called consciousness. And if we do not know where consciousness came from or how consciousness arose, again, where did mind come from if the claim is there was mud first? Does mud produce mind? Where did reason or rationality come from if the claim is rocks were here first? Do rocks create rationality? And so once we begin to think on these lines, we will be able to see that it is very difficult to make an argument based on reason when we don't even know where reason came from. We get that wrong, everything else is wrong. And so, as we summarized yesterday, we came to the conclusion that what is more rational, at least from my perspective, is an eternal God. Because God is the answer the Bible gives me. And it's not just because the Bible gives me that answer, it's because of all of the evidence that supports the Bible. Now, time obviously will not permit me to go through everything to demonstrate that conclusively. But when we think about God, God becomes a logical necessity. Without him, we would not make sense. And when we talk about evidence, we have to keep in mind that there are two types of evidence. There is the evidence that is empirical in nature, evidence that appeals to the five senses, but there is evidence that is wholly in the mind. It is a logical procession of thoughts that lead to a particular conclusion. 
God cannot be proven empirically, but he can and is proven logically. It was Immanuel Kant, a great philosopher of time gone by, who coined the word phenomenon. And we would say that God is a great phenomenon. But he also coined the term noumenon to distinguish what happens in the physical world and how we experience the physical world through our senses as opposed to what happens in the mind and what happens in the mind in formulating judgments ultimately through logic. It must go through thinking and understanding. And so you have both noumenon and phenomenon. In their plural form, it's uh, noumena and phenomena. But the point is this. God is a logical necessity in order for everything else to make sense. Because without God, then you can never explain where consciousness came from. If you cannot explain where consciousness came from, you cannot explain life. Because in order to reason back to the conclusion of where life came from, you need consciousness. And as we begin to think about these things very carefully, very meticulously, no one who understands the questions as the questions we are answering tonight is going to say that God can be proved empirically. God is proved logically. It is a logical argument that the Bible makes. Now, as we think about the question tonight, and we're moving basically from metaphysics to epistemology. The question tonight is, is God a human invention? Now I ask you, how is that possible that God to be a human invention if the human mind is incapable of inventing God in the first place? Last night, Mr. Delahante made a very telling affirmation, a very telling declaration. He said, when we look at nature, there is no thing that tells us about God. We cannot look at nature and from nature reason to God. Now, if that's the case from a purely naturalistic standpoint, where then did I get the concept of God? Because from a naturalist standpoint, and some of the greatest mental philosophers of our day, John Locke and Mr. Delahante mentioned also David Hume, English philosopher and Scottish philosophers. These were renowned men of their day, and we still use their systems to this day. John Locke uh, influenced the government of the United States of America. The very documents upon which this great nation is founded was influenced by the teachings of John Locke. And of course, David Hume in his own right gave us a very systematic teaching about how understanding and consciousness and all of these things work. Did you know that both of them tell us that the mind begins, as John Locke would say, a tabula rasa, a blank slate. And that through empirical stimulation, the mind perceives objects external to itself, and these objects, as they are accessed through our senses, concepts are created in the mind. So we begin as a blank slate, and by what we see, we begin to develop concepts, and over time, we build a frame of reference. If it is the case that in nature, nothing represents God, I ask the question, where did the idea of God come from? Man does not have the mental power to invent God. He does not have the mental acuity to begin to 
reason to the point that there is a God if all he has, if all she has, is nature. We have to ultimately understand that there is another source of information. Somewhere down the stream of time, God had to influence the course of human history by introducing himself. And once the concept of God was introduced to creation, only then did man, as he and she began to corrupt themselves and their civilizations, did false gods become invented. But as we reason all the way back to the beginning, there is no way possible given the model of a naturalist, an atheist, a skeptic, an agnostic, many different terms, and I, I understand that there are distinct differences, nuances of differences, but the point is, if we think that all we have is nature, we could never have invented the idea of God. God had to introduce himself. Now, all of this boils down to one's chronology how we measure time. And it's interesting that chronology is the science of measuring time. And so, in some ways, if we understand the word science and how it's used here in connection to time, God can be proved scientifically only in the sense that he's proved chronologically. Of all the data that is available to us today, there is only one document that takes us all the way back to the beginning. Can you guess what that document is? It is the Bible. And so long as the Bible is understood with regard to its transmission, its translation, and then once we scrutinize and come to a conclusion with regard to its truthfulness, we then can, can develop a trust based upon the testimony that is given to us. And I find it, I was taken aback when Mr. Delahante made the, the, the statement, don't ask me to trust somebody. I can't trust somebody. Now that's all fine and good when we're talking about other people, especially in this situation, but I ask myself, well, how then do you trust your wife? If you can't trust people, how do you trust your wife? How do you trust the people at the bank who take care of your money? How do you trust your automobile to get you from point A to point B as you enter into it? How do you even trust your own senses? to be able to determine truth if that's the case. As human beings, we are hardwired for sociality. And do you know what the undergirding trait of sociality is in order for it to function properly? Trust. If there is no trust and we cannot trust, then that's tantamount to saying, I can't believe anything. But when we put it in terms of trusting people of ancient days who wrote things, then we want to pick and choose how we use that term. And we'll see how he responds in just a moment. Now, he also made some statements with regard to evidence, and he was appealing to Deuteronomy 18, a, a section of scripture that was given earlier today. But in Deuteronomy 18, it does not say that if these things did not occur as God said, then it was not God. Go and read Deuteronomy 18, 15 and following. And there it will show you that it does say that if this thing did not come to pass, it's because God did not say it. And this is the criterion, at least in this area, of determining what is truth from what is falsehood. So as we begin to look at these things, we have to understand that the only way man could invent God is if God first introduced the concept himself. Now when we begin to look at history, 
The evidence external to the Bible takes us back to about 3500 B.C. And there we can begin to analyze these things. And we begin with the ancient civilizations of Mesopotamia. There we have the Sumerians. From them, we go into, of course, uh, the Ur of Chaldees, which was one aspect of the Sumerians that we know about that is confirmed not only extra-biblically, but biblically. From them, we uh, move to the Egyptians. From the Egyptians, we uh, turn our attention to the Assyrians. From the Assyrians, we go to the Babylonians. From the Babylonians, we go to the Persians. From the Persians, we go to the Greeks. From the Greeks, we go to the Romans. All of this is verifiable extra-biblically. The Bible only supports or runs consistent, runs parallel with what we can determine even in the documents of human history. And guess what? In 1995, a very noted archaeologist of Germany discovered a place called the Gobekli Tepe. And this particular place has fascinated scientists and archaeologists all over the world. I challenge you and I encourage you to, to go and look at these things in YouTube and you can Google them, Wikipedia, Gobli Tepe. Gobekli Tepe. In 1995, they discovered this area in a part of the world where a large area has been discovered of containing underground an ancient civilization. And from 1995 until today, which has almost been two decades, they've only excavated a very small percentage of this ancient civilization. Now, our best scientists, our best archaeologists from all over the world have tested and measured these things, and they say that it dates to a time when in the secularists' chronology, human beings should be in what they call the Stone Age. The Flintstones. Do you remember how we in a very light way depict human society in the Stone Age. At that particular time, they were saying that uh, we were very, very close to the beasts of the earth, and we were still unlearned in many different ways. Whereas in the Flintstone cartoon, they already had the wheel. According to secular chronology, in the Stone Age, they had not even invented the wheel. And in this site, the Gobekli Tepe, that they found, they discovered such a sophisticated civilization that it defies the scientific thinking, especially as it relates to the secular chronology that has been placed there by geologists and others. At this time, people should be basically dumb and should be walking around grunting. And yet, they have a very sophisticated system of living. And guess what part they accidentally discovered of this society? It was their place of worship. These people were already worshiping gods. And what's interesting, as they began to analyze this, as they excavated many areas in this in this region, we are told that they already even had a system of agriculture, though they were only hunters. They were not farmers yet, according to the chronology. And so this disrupts the entire thinking of a person who views time only from a secular perspective. When we follow the Bible, we begin right we entertain what happened between the beginning and the end, but we most certainly will end right as well, as long as we remain consistent, especially as it relates to chronology. Is God of human invention? The answer is yes and no. Because logically, God, the true God, 
must have interjected himself somewhere in the stream of time so that man could take that concept and then corrupt it to invent other gods. And this is the yes part or the yes answer to this question. No, God cannot be invented by the human mind, which logically means, and it takes us back to last night's question, there must have been something there to begin with. Because we have something today that directly implies that there has always been something. You cannot begin by thinking that nothing was here to begin with. That's a wrong model. There has always been something and there will always be something because something now is. And if something now is, there had to be a first something that is uncaused, outside of space and time, that gave rise to everything else. We cannot say that that's God directly. We don't jump from that logical conclusion to God until we come to terms with his revealing, with his, inspiri for, with his inspired word. And God doesn't just say, hey, you need to believe in me. You need to accept what I say. God says, come, let us reason together. Mr. De La Hante wanted to make it seem like, well, I'm God and you better listen to me. God says, I'm God. And here's the evidence for my existence. An evidence that demonstrates that I'm not only all-powerful, all-knowing, present everywhere at once, immutable, eternal, holy, but most importantly, I'm a God of love and compassion. And is it possible for people to be sincere and yet wrong? It most certainly is. Mr. Delahante believes that just because a person is sincere, then that separates him or her from any moral responsibility. One can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. Even the Bible in, in the book of Romans chapter 10, verses 1 and following, there the apostle Paul had to tell the Romans who had trouble with worshiping false gods that it was not enough to have a zeal for God. One had to have a zeal for God plus a correct knowledge of God. Just because one is sincere in his or her pursuit doesn't mean that they get a pass. Oh, you're sincere? Okay. We're, we're going to overlook you. Try that argument with the officer as you're driving down the street and uh, he pulls you over and he says, Hey, buddy, you were speeding. Uh, there were no signs. I didn't see uh, uh, a speed limit posted. But uh, I'm, I'm really sincere in my driving and can, can you just let me pass this time? I said that one time to a police officer. He goes, that's not my decision. And he wrote out the ticket. Sincerity is all well and fine, but that does not mean that we cannot be wrong or that that automatically gives us a pass. And so to summarize, is God a human invention? He cannot be a human invention because man has no power to invent him. And if we want to get into a discussion of the power of imagination, then we can do that because imagination has no creative powers. Imagination begins with what's already inputted and it only reconstructs and recombines. And so I can imagine a pig with wings, but I first must see a pig and I must know what wings are to construct that. Where did I ever get a concept of God if all I have is nature? That is a logical, irrefutable position. Somewhere down the stream of time, God had to interject himself and then man, because of his position, and his often rebellion of God, rebellion against God, 
he then created other gods. And so the Egyptians worshipped over 80 different gods. The Sumerians worshipped different gods. And God revealed himself in a time where the world was polytheistic and he was calling for one God. I'm glad we agree we can be sincere and sincerely wrong. It's the one thing we both said. Um, so basically the argument is that man can't possibly create a God. And I find that patently false. See, the only thing that you need to be able to create a God is, hey, I'm a man and I can do certain things. And I can then envision a Superman who can do those things better. And from there, I can envision a super Superman. And it is simply a logical progression to say, hmm, is it possible that there's some being that could do everything and do it perfectly? The idea that we couldn't conceive of this is something that I, I just find baffling and absurd. The fact that we can't conceive of it properly may be the case, because we have a very difficult time grasping infinity as in vastness. And when we talk about you know, uh, the various, some, some of the God models that have the various omni characteristics, obviously we don't know what it's like to be omnipotent, and yet we still have this concept where we can approximate it. It's absolutely trivial to begin with, here's this, what happens if, it makes it, if we make it better, if we make it faster, if we make it stronger, if we make it greater, more, have more capabilities? By his model, how did we ever conceive of magic? I don't recall having to witness magic in order to be able to conceive of it. He referenced last night um, that, uh, or he, said, he pointed out that I said, I, I don't trust anyone. That's not remotely what I said. That's not even close. It's not even the same ballpark. I said that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and I cannot take a person's word as the sole source of evidence for an extraordinary claim. If you tell me you have a pet dog, I'm happy to take your word for it because I have plenty of evidence that we have dogs and that people keep them as pets. If you tell me you have a pet fire-breathing dragon, I'm not just going to take your word for it. I'm going to need more than that. I trust people all the time. I t the, the other thing that Hume taught us is that the wise man, and he should have said wise person, apportions their belief to the evidence that your level of confidence in a particular idea should be proportional to the evidence that supports it. And likewise, I think this applies to trust. I trust my wife because I have good reason to. Does that mean that I can't be wrong? Of course not. Does it mean she couldn't deceive me? Nope. But I trust her. What do you mean you trust her? Do you trust her implicitly with everything? Well, no. Not to, I, if I bought a new Maserati, uh, I wouldn't trust her with it. <laughs> and it's because she has a driving phobia and traffic and stuff. I mean, it's just a bad idea. I have evidence that it's a bad way to do, but I trust her. Um, we talk about the senses. How can you trust your senses? And there's this idea in philosophy about the senses being properly basic, and it's one that, um, depending on the context, I accept or reject, and, and I'm not going to go into the deep philosophy about properly basic beliefs. Um, but the thing is, we know our senses aren't trustworthy. They are not implicitly correct. They are not absolute in that sense of trust. And we can determine how good they are and how bad they are. How many people got glasses on? That's because we can tell how good your eyes are. We can tell when they're trustworthy and when they're not. Optical illusions, our ability for our brain to perceive reality is often confused. And how we do this, people, you know, you set a bottle of Coke in front of me and I look at it and I say, hmm, my eyes tell me that that's a bottle of Coke. Is that enough? Can I just trust my eyes? What if I only have one eye and I don't have depth perception? No, he, all of your senses in concert demonstrate the reliability and the unreliability of those senses. Similarly, it's the reason science makes use of peer review. Because what I saw when I did the experiment in the lab may not be the same thing that you see. And so it's up to you to investigate it and verify that I did in fact get it right or demonstrate that I got it wrong. This just trusting of the senses, I mean, it's, it's not anything that we even worry about. now. The, uh, I took a terrible note there, I don't even know what it says. Uh, 
the, the idea that uh, I have this concept that God says you must worship in, in this simplistic idea. Of course not. If God said I'm a, that I must worship, I'd worship. Well, actually, I wouldn't. But I'd believe that a God existed because God said so. I don't have any evidence that God has said anything. What I have are a bunch of people claiming that God said something. And I don't have sufficient evidence for that extraordinary claim to trust that when they tell me God said this, that they're correct. I don't know what the, the claim was uh, that I was trying to avoid moral responsibility. I guess we'll deal with that tomorrow because I, nothing I said even came close to denying moral responsibility. But this idea that you don't get a pass, that when I was talking about um, that people could sincerely believe. Well, I understand. If there's a rule and you violate it, you know, if, if God actually has as a requirement, let's say, baptism for, for salvation and you didn't follow that rule, you broke the rule and God can do whatever he wants with you. My objection was actually a little bit more about whether or not this is a reasonable proposition that all of these other people who got it wrong weren't doing what they should do to get it right. It's about the methodology of how you get to that conclusion. And quite frankly, the speed limit isn't up for interpretation. I don't have to interpret the speed limit correctly. It's not a wavering thing. And so when I get pulled over, whether I knew the speed limit or not is different from whether in order for me to know about the speed limit, I would have had to read through the law and properly interpret it, and other people may have interpreted it in different ways, and we have countless citizens who are saying, no, it's actually 42, no, it's 43, no, it's 85, and we have no demonstrated method, nothing to actually cite that's clear to everybody. If it has to be interpreted, it is necessarily subject to human error. What kind of wise being would establish a system and write down their most important words in ancient books that die off and get translated and depend on people interpreting or write, fallible beings. One of the questions that I'll ask you tomorrow, I'll give you a preview when we talk about morality, is as a fallible being, if there was a God and a devil, they are both far more powerful than I am and both have the capability of fooling me and I'm not sure how I could distinguish between the two of them. So I'm wondering how it is that people have come to the conclusion that God is the good one and Satan is the evil one. Because you seem to be judging them both by their own standards. And as a fallible being, how do you know you've come to the right answer? And if you keep just pointing back to, well, God has to be the good one. Yeah, but how do you know that? But I guess we'll save that for tomorrow. Well, I want to spend some time thinking about uh, his first comment there, and that is, that he's never heard or never thought of how you need to see something first, perceive it before it exists in the mind. He mentioned Superman and he mentioned magic. Now this of course is understanding that when man did invent the concept of a Superman, which Mr. Delahante cannot pinpoint when that happened, as far as we know, we are dependent on the records to tell us when man began to invent the idea of God, and God is much, much more superior than what we would understand as Superman. As a matter of fact, Superman, uh, for me, is something very different than for someone older in the audience, depending on what TV show we came to terms with Superman. And the point is, that if the Bible is true, and that of course is up for debate, but we have given extensive evidence for why we would say reasonably that it is true. Uh, Matt cannot say that we have not given evidence. It's the evidence that he just doesn't like, but it's evidence nevertheless. But when we look at the Bible, we began with God and his creation that involve the human being. And so the Bible teaches us that God interjected himself right from the beginning. From that point forward, man was operating already with the concept of God. And so the idea of a Superman came from the idea of a God that was initially instituted into the thinking of man. It's not the other way around. Magic came more likely than not, from a corruption of an understanding of miracle. 
and God worked all through the ancient days in a miraculous fashion. As a matter of fact, by the time the story of the Egyptians unfold in the book of Exodus, what were Pharaoh's magicians able to do already by that time? They had already developed a system of trickery. How did they come to terms with that? You have to keep your chronology consistent. It's not that we invented those things, it's that those things came from a mind that has already been introduced to concepts that could be reconstructed to give us something like a Superman or magic. And then he talks about, lost my notes here, but then he talks about uh, trust and he says uh, that he can trust uh, various people, but that's not how he came off in the beginning when he made the statement that he does not trust people and he was making reference to the witnesses of the Bible. And he made it into something else that we were not even addressing and successfully diverted the force of that particular argument. He talks about the senses being untrustworthy. And we understand that the senses can be deceived, but we also understand that the senses are trustworthy. And so when we think about the senses, we know that they can be deceived. We know that they're trustworthy. We have to strike a balance. We do not automatically say that because the senses can be deceived, then I'm suspect of everything I see, everything I hear, everything I smell, everything I taste, and everything I touch. Our human mind and our consciousness gives us the ability to make fine-tuned adjustments that as we live life, we begin to understand what things may deceive us and what things are verifiable and true. We learn about mirages. We learn about light refraction. We learn about depth perception. We learn about all of these things. And then the mind, as it begins to figure things out, we develop a very elaborate system where we can trust the senses and we understand that the senses can deceive us. And so we make certain that our steps are, our steps are proper. Now he talked about where is the evidence that sub substantiates all of this that we've been talking about. And we've been saying that for the last two days. The evidence goes back ultimately to the word of God. Now he said that uh, other people have studied and have demonstrated that the Word of God is unreliable, and he leads us to a couple of websites. But we also have websites where we can go and we can demonstrate that the Bible is reliable. And unless you and I go to these things and think about these things rationally, we will never be able to determine for ourselves what is the truth regarding that particular issue. The point is, we understand that there are two sides to this question about whether or not God exists, about whether or not God is of human invention, about whether or not there is truth, reality, and any other question that is profound and significant in meaning. But until we take the time to actually sit down and consider the evidence, we will not know which side is true. But there is evidence. Mr. De La Hante acts as if there is no evidence. He keeps on saying, I have no good reason to believe this. Here is a book, which is the result of 1,600 years, given to us by about 40 different authors. And as we begin to look at this book and analyze it, we understand that from Genesis to Revelation, with a 400-year period in the middle of silence, that these different authors from different places and different occupations, when they spoke, they spoke with clarity. They spoke with precision. So that what we find in Genesis does not contradict what we find in Revelation. What we find in Romans does not contradict what we find in James. And sometimes these people were separated by thousands of years. Now, we understand that there are ostensible contradictions and we don't deny that. The Bible itself tells you in both the Old Testament and the New Testament that there are some very difficult things to understand. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, Peter, talking about Paul and the wisdom that was given to him, wrote about some things which the unlearned and unstable twist to their own destruction. Even the Bible recognizes that there are some difficult parts 
that someone who's not developed their thinking will misapprehend. And if he or she misapprehends that, that will lead to a misinterpretation which will result in a misapplication. Did not the Hebrew writer get after the first century Christians because by the time that they were taught about Melchizedek, they should have known more than they did? And Melchizedek is an obscure figure of Old Testament history mentioned just once there and another times alluded to in the New Testament. And there we have scant testimony that God utilizes through certain individuals that he speaks through to build a particular case. And though the evidence is scant, it's still enough to make a particular point. And the people who had to have a kind of developed thinking about the evidence and about chronology and about the situation because they neglected their powers of reasoning that needed to be sharpened, they could not understand. It was not that God did not reveal himself. It was not that God did not offer a method. It was not that they could not do it because God gave them the ability to do it. It was because he or she failed to develop their own senses. He talks about a methodology of interpretation. How do we know? How do we know? Again, we go back to the Bible. The reason the Bible has been given to us in the manner it has been given to us and just recognize it is a book. What does a book imply? It implies information. It implies that the person who is to receive the book has the ability to assimilate this information. There is a very elaborate process. It's called language. Language implies mind. Language also implies vocabulary, words, semantics, syntax. And there were some arguments that were made in the Bible that were reduced even to the grammar of a word. The Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians chapter 3 argued down to the plurality of a word. And so there is a very elaborate system that is identified in Scripture that helps us to learn to interpret not only the Bible itself, but ourselves and the world in which we live. The book of Proverbs in the very first chapter, the very first six verses teaches us that the Proverbs, which are profound pithy statements, are designed to help us to sharpen our thinking. That the more we sharpen our thinking, the better discerners we become of language and everything else around us. If we want a method of interpretation, we turn to God and he through natural means and with the abilities that he's endowed us with, gives us the power to reason from point A to point Z. But Mr. De La Hante cannot even, you it. Mr. De La Hante cannot even explain where consciousness came from that gives us the power to reason in the first place. 10 minutes cross-examination. Sure. So, so it's partly because I reject your contention that we have to know where it came from in order to be able to use it. I agree it would be helpful. Um, so you said that the, the Bible is written clearly and precisely, and then you pointed out that there was arguments over a gram of a word, and that it recognizes that there are difficulties, and that you have to sharpen your thinking. What about the people who are mentally incapable of doing these gymnastics of studying to possibly come to the right answer? When we look at the scriptures, we are able to deduce that responsibility is the result of opportunity and possibility, or capability and opportunity equals responsibility. In a case where an individual is born with a deformity or with some type of defect, whether it be physical or mental, that prevents them from utilizing all of what God intended for them to have, then this is a matter that God himself will judge. It is a matter of clemency. And this, of course, we deduce from Scripture. You remember, as an example, uh, from the New Testament, looking back into the Old Testament, there were certain qualifications that God accepted, though he had given a hard, fast commandment. The situation in the New Testament where one's ox fell into the ditch, and uh, you remember under the Old Testament, violating the Sabbath was a no-no. And there were some very strict rules associated with that. 
But in the New Testament, as Jesus begins to explain how all of that functioned, Jesus also introduced that there were some quali qualifying items where when those items are set in motion, then they alleviate the person from responsibility. If I'm driving to worship God on a Sunday morning, which is a commandment that as a good Christian, I want to honor and uphold, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, and all of a sudden I get a blowout and I pull over to the side and I have to deal with that and consequently it takes me several hours to deal with that and I miss services. If God were to return at that very moment, is he going to say, guilty sinner? No. God is an understanding God. And there are certain things that will qualify responsibility when extenuating circumstances occur. So if there's clemency as a basis of understanding, um, then maybe it's the case, for example, that Baptism isn't required for salvation for the people who didn't understand that to be the case. If we reason from the premise that we're talking about a person with his or her full mental faculties intact, then when we're talking about a particular doctrine of the Bible, he or she is responsible. Remember, the construct that I gave, if there is capability, and there is the opportunity, then responsibility is intact. And when that's the case, if we're dealing with a person of their full mental faculties, then we turn to the Bible and we begin to show them about baptism. And baptism is very clear. Uh, it's very surprising that he would bring up baptism with Churches of Christ because in the history of Churches of Christ, I mean, we've done some extensive study in baptism. And baptism, as it is demonstrated and discussed in Scripture, is a point of doctrine where we can come to terms with it completely as God would have us to understand it. We know why God does not allow merely pouring or sprinkling. And we argue from the word itself, baptizo, and it means to dip, to fully submerge. We can go to the use of the metaphor in the book of Colossians, where the Bible refers to baptism as a burial. And we cross-reference that with the book of Romans in chapter 6, and how a burial must mean that one is covered, and how baptism is the only act of salvation wherein one comes in contact with the blood of Christ through faith. Uh, that's all throughout the scriptures, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5. And as we begin to think about the power of baptism, then baptism is the only means whereby God saves an individual. And so we take an individual carefully through the scriptures and we show them everything the Bible teaches them. Remember, we're assuming we're talking to a, a person who has all of their mental faculties operating. When that happens and the person is responsible, there is no clemency in that case because there is no extenuating circumstances, no preventative circumstance that would keep them from understanding this completely. So you said that I can't pinpoint the origin of Superman, and I, I don't mean in Krypton, but, um, and I didn't even actually necessarily mean the guy with the big S on his chest. I'm talking about the idea of a Superman. Um, and since I can't pinpoint it, your contention is that uh, it's most likely that we couldn't have even come to the idea of a Superman if we didn't have this notion of God from God, that Superman is actually derived from God rather than derived from men. And why is it that it's impossible, according to you, for me to recognize that one man has greater capabilities than another and then conceive of someone who has greater capabilities than that? As we look at the history of all of this, uh, the mysterious being in red and blue with the big S on his chest, we know uh, 
As we go back to the 1950s, we know that the concept of Superman is there. I'm not sure if uh, Stan Lee was responsible for him. It may be, he may be with, associated with another group there. I always get DC and Marvel mixed up. But uh, if he's not talking about that, I can go back to the 1800s and I read there about one named Friedrich Wilhelm Nietzsche. And he introduced the idea of the Ubermech, the overman or the superman. And uh, does Mr. De La Hante mean that? If I go further back, and remember, eventually, I'm going to come to a point where I can no longer go back, where secular chronology ends, biblical chronology picks up. And I go back all the way to the beginning, and I find there that God, as he created man, Man came to terms with his creator and already had a system of thinking about someone higher and superior. We don't know everything that we would like to know about Adam and Eve and about God and their relationship, but there are some indications that they had a very close relationship. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 3 when uh, Adam and Eve had sinned and hid themselves that God was walking in the cool of the day. And so there it demonstrates that God had a very personal relationship with his creation and had taught them several things. Now when they were expelled from the Garden of Eden, we understand all that happened there. Eventually man's demise comes about. But if I see one man who is greater than me, yes, I can reasonably say, here is an individual that is superior than me in strength, in probably speed, in probably wit. But how do I reason from that to something that is infinite? There is nothing in nature that represents infinite. And please don't say a number, because numbers are not a part of physical nature. Numbers are abstract concepts. So there's nothing in nature that will point me to something superior in the same way that we describe God. And the very basis of God is infinity. Nothing in nature represents infinity. Pi is a number. Uh, some clever arguments from others, they say, well, what if I put two mirrors and as they bounce off each other, I can see it seems forever. But that's contingent on the two mirrors. That's not even an example of infinity. What in nature teaches us about the infinite? And therefore, we depend on what the Bible teaches and we reason from that by Proper deduction. Uh, how much time's left? Ten seconds. Thanks. Your turn. <laughs> My first question for Matt is what is imagination? In what construct does imagination function? And how is imagination used by human beings? And how, through imagination, does one invent the idea of a God based upon everything that I've already presented? Well, I can't do it based on everything you presented because you keep going back to the Bible, and I'm not doing it from there. But uh, yeah, this is this is why I, I raised that question at the end. Is you know this assertion that it's impossible to get from the things that we experience to then conceiving of a God, and the primary contention here that he raises is that we can't conceive of an infinite, and there's no infinite uh, in nature, um, although we could draw a circle and understand endless or never-ending. Uh, that's not identical to infinite. Um, but I see no problem with, with this idea of reasoning by comparison. As a matter of fact, I think that's how we pretty much do everything, and we'll probably talk about that a little bit with morality. If I understand myself and my capabilities, and I see some other animal with other capabilities. Imagination is what allows me to say, what would it be like if I could run like a cheetah? What would it be like if I could fly like a bird? And these extended capabilities 
well, I guess could lead us to the actual blue and red Superman, uh, although I think he violates the laws of physics. But it's not, it, I, don't, I don't even see this as a difficulty. Ad imagination is what we use when our brain thinks about things and examines possibilities. I have never, you know, I didn't have a problem with the idea that everything we produce in our brain is actually a cobbling together of other ideas. I'm okay with that because I think that seems to be roughly the way we learn and the way we work. I don't know that it's necessarily impossible for us to come up with something out of whole cloth. I, but I'm okay with the idea that we experience things, but we extrapolate from there. That's how we get to Superman. Now, what about God? Well, first of all, I was talking about gods to begin with, because there's lots of proposed gods and they're not all infinite. Um, and we would probably agree, may, I don't know, I, I thought we would agree that men created them, but if men are incapable of creating, I don't know, is, are men cre incapable of creating gods or the god? <laughs> Yeah, well, you, yeah, you can. You need the God first, and then to get to God. Create gods. Yeah, and I, I reject that as flatly false. I don't need the God in order to get to gods, because not all gods are infinite. Not all God, Some gods have very limited human failings. They are nothing more than superhumans. The Greek pantheon of gods were not infinite beings. They were nothing that was impossible to conceive of. And I'd argue that we don't need for there to be a God or even a concept of the God for us to be able to reason from, here's my capabilities, hey, this can fly, what would it be like if I could fly? What, what would it be like if I could move really fast, faster than anybody else? To think about these possibilities, it's how we end up with Star Trek and faster than light travel and the idea of time machines. We don't even know if that's possible or impossible. And I don't know why I raised it twice in one discussion, but it's obviously on my mind. This is what imagination is. This is imagination is taking the possible and extrapolating it, or taking the existent and extrapolating it to see what might be possible, what might be conceivable. And this is how we learn more about the universe because we get these neat ideas of, hey, this might be possible. Let's see if it is possible. The Wright brothers, what was it like to fly? Well, we can't do it by flapping. We tried that, the videos are hilarious. But maybe there's some other way that we can achieve something similar. And imagination is what drives that process of discovery. We didn't need a concept of a plane to be implanted in reality in order to then invent a plane from our imagination. It is a cobbling together of the other ideas. And I don't see why you have to draw a hard line in our ability to extrapolate at a god. I just want to just take a few minutes to, to say something about time travel, and then I'll ask my next question. Okay. Time travel is not possible because in order for time travel to be possible, we would, need, we would need to be able to travel faster than the speed of light. According to the theory of relativity, E equals mc squared, if it is possible to travel the, faster than the speed of light, then time can literally come to a stop. And the faster you travel beyond the speed of light, theoretically, you should be able to reverse time. And since there is a universal speed limit, which was discovered, hinted at first by uh, Newton and then uh, discovered by Albert Einstein, and I might add that Albert Einstein figured these things out not through what we would say is conventional science, but through pure theoretical reasoning. He developed some very major concepts, and that's why we cannot uh, time travel. Until we can break the speed of light, then we can really think about traveling in time. But my next question is, you mentioned about methods of interpretation. Do you believe that there is a method of interpretation for language, or is it a free-for-all in deciding how language works, how language means, if you write a letter to your wife, does she have to have some kind of structure of interpretation that both you and she understand in order for communication to exist? Sure, and on, on time travel, I didn't know we'd proved it impossible because there are other theories like wormholes and stuff that would violate this cosmic speed limit, which is why we're still talking about it. But. <clears throat> With regard to language, um, it's not a 
free-for-all in the sense that sometimes been applied. To answer the question directly, yes, in order for my wife and I to carry on a conversation using language, we must have the same or similar understanding of the actual uh, grammatical rules of language and how words are used. But that's all that's required because, as I mentioned last night, language is a tool. It's a tool to communicate concepts, and as long as we share the same concepts and the same understandings, then Beth and I can communicate. And it doesn't matter whether somebody else uses those concepts and those, those uh, basically we're talking about phonemes in another way. I mean, that's why we have different languages. There are words uh, that in other languages that are used fairly commonly that would be very offensive in ours. They're the same phonemes, they have different meanings. And the only thing that's important is that the individuals using them share a common understanding. We can discuss where we have a disagreement about a term, um, and the usage of words changes. Bad does not mean what bad meant, you know, and neither does gay. Um, and, and a number of other things. The usage of words changes, language changes over time. Yes, we have to have a similar concept, but that doesn't mean that words have meaning. You mentioned this yesterday, that words have meaning, and you seem to imply that this meaning is intrinsic to them. And I find that just flatly false. A collection of letters, a, a grouping of phonemes, doesn't have an intrinsic meaning. It has a meaning that we imbue from it, that we put in it, and it has the, share, the shared understanding of that word is what gives it value. It's like saying that XJR395 has some intrinsic meaning. It doesn't, but if you and I agree that this is the model number of a particular car, now it is a pointer to a concept, as we would talk about in computer language, it's a pointer to a concept. It's not, it doesn't have an intrinsic meaning unto itself. Oh, give him an extra 10 seconds. I had that left over. <laughs> um, I just want to take, some, uh, take a few moments to respond to that because uh, as we think about the philosophy of language, and this gets into some very deep areas of thinking. You can go all the way back to Plato's uh, dialogues, Therasmicus, and uh, an entire philosophy of language that was constructed through that dialogue as they began to think about what language is and what is its function and whether words have meanings or not. And so back in the fourth and fifth centuries BC, they were, they were already discussing these things. But remember, our basis goes all the way back to the Bible. When God created Adam and placed him in the garden, he gave him the task, the Herculean task, of naming the animals. And so there we understand that when God created the human being, he gave him the power to understand something about language. In Genesis chapter 11, we uh, can read there about the Tower of Babel and how the whole earth was of one language and spoke, uh, had one word and one language is what the Bible there reads. And then at that moment, there was a division of the languages. I can't finish the, the concept, but uh, basically, language is something that we can understand how meaning derives. And if you want a very thought-provoking discussion, then, then, then ask the question, what came first, a thought or a word? Thought. I'll save you the time. <laughs> that was my 10 seconds. <laughs> Yeah, the question is, who's thought? All right, so this is our question uh, session. So remember, ask the question in a uh, clear, uh, terse manner. We're trying to get as many questions as possible. We'll go from one side to another. Just raise up your hand if you have a question. We'll come to you. And once again, be respectful as you're asking these questions. All right? Board. Sure. I, I, I answered this partly last night. And, it, and I will admit um, that it's a bit of a dodge um, because it's, I, I recognize that it would be arrogant of me to think that I could tell the difference, which is something I'll probably talk about more tomorrow night. What am I looking for as far as evidence? I can't give you specifics, but what I can give you, and last night I mentioned that if there is a God, it should know exactly what evidence would convince me and it should be capable of producing it, and it hasn't so far, or I, maybe I've been stubborn, was the thing that came up. Um, I, I don't like to give glib answers like, you know, a writing in the sky that everybody can read. 
But I would say that either a god exists or it doesn't. This is just the only two options. And if a god exists, it either interacts in reality in some detectable way, or it doesn't. Those are the only two options there, and they're direct negations. If it doesn't interact in, in reality in any detectable way, it is logically indistinguishable from the god that doesn't exist. So if we're going to be talking about a god that we can actually detect, that could present some evidence, it needs to be a god that manifests in reality, and in many religions, in many versions that we're talking about. I don't need something amazing. I just need a little bit. I need something more than this book says so, and this book is consistent with reality, or this book hasn't been proved false yet, uh, because that's a shifting of the burden of proof. Um, I'm, I'm a little irritated at the idea of a god who is finicky about how much evidence and what quality of evidence he provides to different people. So that Saul gets a Damascus road appearance and the ancient Israelites get pillars of fire and cloud and fed manna from heaven and witness to many miracles, even though seemingly they turn their back on that God right away, which is something that I just don't even think is realistic. I mean, if you were in a, uh, a foreign country and you prayed uh, and a ball of light showed up, you know, you're, you've got, you're with your, your wife who's pregnant and about to deliver and a ball of light shows up, leads you to a car that's got keys in it, and the ball of light leads you down a road, uh, the cars get out of your way and you get all the way hospital, there is nothing. I don't think any reasonable person would ever not believe that that was God or not believe that that God existed. And certainly I don't think a reasonable person would say, ah, the heck with that God, what's he done for me lately? Let me just go ahead and invent a new, a new God out of whole cloth. I'm not asking for that type of evidence necessarily, but what I get, um, I don't get anything from God that I'm aware of, but what I get from apologists quite frequently is, look at the trees, look at the world, the fact that you're standing here, these, these things that seem intuitive, I fully admit, I, it seems intuitively correct, and God seems like an amazing answer, and I don't see that God as an explanation for anything. And so when people point to evidence, I wouldn't say there's no evidence, because, okay, we've got anecdotal evidence, we've got testimonial evidence. I, I don't have a good reason to think that that testimonial evidence is reliable. And furthermore, as I'll probably repeat tomorrow, I find that a God who is so fickle about who's going to get evidence and who's going to get what kind of evidence, you know, that showed favoritism towards the Israelites or Saul or whatever, and that then would punish someone for honestly exercising their intellect and saying, this is not sufficient, this appeal to there must have been a first cause and therefore blah, 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 Jesus or the, the various arguments from ignorance that we have of you haven't proved this wrong, so it's right. Any God that would punish anybody for being intellectually honest is immoral. And while I can't prove to anybody that I have been an honest seeker, you know, whether the question came up yesterday, it may be that I'm just too stubborn. I can't prove that to anybody else. Um, if there is a God, he'll know how sincerely, sincere I was or wasn't. Um, and, you know, I guess we could deal with that at that time, but you know, there are, I, I know people who are less sincere, who seem to have been granted uh, evidences uh, that the rest of us just don't get. Uh, so I can't give you a specific, but I think God knows, and I'm still waiting. Well, I don't know, but so let me, re let me re restate the question. Uh, he was referring to when I talked about David Hume, and David Hume basically says, if somebody tells me that a man was raised from the dead, I have to consider which of these three possibilities is most likely, that the individual relaying this information to me has been deceived, is attempting to deceive, or that the event actually happened. Um, those are the three possibilities that you consider. It doesn't mean that the third po possibility is actually factually possible in reality. For example, it may be impossible uh, for, for you to flap your wings and fly. But if you tell me you can flap your wings and fly, I have to consider, is he deceived? Is he attempting to deceive me? Or is this actually possible? And what Hume tells us, which is, this is very important, reject the greater miracle. He doesn't say accept the lesser miracle because that presumes that, you, that the, you know, you've, you've considered all possibilities. There may be possibilities you haven't considered. He's not telling you what to accept. You know, given 
three or four possible explanations for this, except the one that is least extraordinary. He's saying, reject the one that is the most extraordinary. And this is the, the path to making sure that your positions are best, are most likely founded in reason. It's not an assertion that this one that is least likely is necessarily untrue. This goes back to extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The, you know, if you tell me you've got a pet dog, okay. You can tell me you've got a pet dragon, well, now we're in a different ballpark. If you tell me that aliens spirited you away and took you back in time and you witnessed the resurrection so that you are an eyewitness, okay, now we've got a really big claim. And it could be the case that it happened. I, I can't say that it didn't, um, although time travel is impossible. Uh, it could be the case that uh, you are deceived. And it could be the case that you are attempting to deceive me. I tend not to assume that people are trying to deceive me. Um, I tend to assume that they're deceived. And, and that comes across as kind of insulting. And actually, I prefer to phrase it as mistaken. It's like when, I, when conspiracy theorists talk about things, like we heard about Zeitgeist, the film today, which is garbage. I'll say it again from here. Uh, they take disparate facts and they weave together a model, a, a story that seems compelling. And when you consider that, the failing that they tend to make is that they assume intent rather than incompetence. You know, that this happened, it's, is it more likely that this was a mistake that somebody made or are they actually involved in this massive conspiracy to deceive you? And it, I think it's a mistake to assume conspiracy when mistakes and incompetence are everywhere. I mean, they're, they're rampant. We, all, we both made mistakes tonight. I've probably made more than he has. So that's, that's the thing on Hume. Sure. So the question was, uh, I keep saying I don't know, and uh, that sounds so much closer to agnostic than atheist. Uh, so let me clear this up. Uh, I, I keep hitting that mic. I'm, oh, I'm waving my arms. Um, agnostic and atheist aren't mutually exclusive. The way I use the terms goes down to kind of the foundations of the terms. Where theism and atheism address a question of belief, Gnosticism and agnosticism address a question of knowledge. Knowledge is a subset of belief, and therefore agnosticism and Gnosticism could be subsets of theism and atheism, or more correctly, I guess, anti-theism. So one could be a Gnostic theist or an agnostic theist, in case, both cases, they believe there is a God, but whether or not they claim to know, and we can quibble about the definition of knowledge, whether it requires absolute certainty or just a massive amount of certainty or whatever, they could be a Gnostic theist or an agnostic theist. Um, and similarly, uh, depending on your definitions of knowledge, I may or may not be an agnostic atheist or a, a Gnostic atheist, depending on the, I, sometimes I think I'm a Gnostic atheist if, if you get down to it, and I identify sometimes as a hard atheist or an anti-theist, that I actively believe the proposition that there are no gods, um, which is very different from I do not believe the proposition that there are gods. And because those terms aren't mutually exclusive, the one bit of confusion, if you take nothing else from me being here, agnosticism is not a middle ground between theism and atheism. It may be a middle position between theism and anti-theism, the belief that there is a God and the belief that there are no gods, but there is no middle position between I believe X and I do not believe X. I don't know if that's gonna sink in. Um, the gumball analogy that I used last night, there's a, uh, a, a jar here full of gumballs. There's either an even number or an odd number. And you say that the number is even. Now, I can either believe that the number is even or not believe that the number's even. But if I don't believe the number's even, that does not believe that I mean it's, I believe it's odd. So there's no middle ground between I believe it's even and I don't believe it's even. There may be a middle ground between I believe it's even and I believe it's odd, but that's not agnosticism. And those are, I, I don't know, hope, hopefully that made sense. It's just not a middle ground, sorry. As we think about the philosophy of language, again, as I mentioned earlier, before time ran out, this is a very deep study. It's very profound. Uh, we take it for granted sometimes because the way we grow up learning language is through mimicry. 
And uh, we know a bunch of different words and their associated meanings before we begin to give thought about where those words came from and how those associated meanings developed. But as we think about the very, very beginning and we go back to the Bible, we have to have an objective reality that helps us to make sense of ourselves first and then of everything else around us. And this begins with concepts. Uh, a few moments ago, I don't know if you picked it up, but I asked the question to the audience, what came first, a thought or a word? And Matt said, a thought, I'll save you the trouble. Well, that's very surprising because if thought came first, then the question is, who's thought? And those thoughts lead to concepts those concepts are directly associated with what we call truth and truth is the basis for reality. And so you have these concepts that come from the first mind or intelligence that creates us with mind and intelligence where these thoughts can be reproduced. And then as these thoughts develop over time, we give names to them in certain cases, but in other cases, there are already thoughts given to us with names. For example, in the account of Genesis chapter 1 and 2, you see a general picture of the creation. In Genesis chapter 2, you see a specific uh, picture of the creation, but there God is already communicating with Adam. And yet, we're not told of any specific system that God had given, but there because the Bible is not designed to prove every little detail, we have to reason from what we have back to what we can know. And from all of that, we begin to understand that concepts are given to us first and then we, pla we place names on these concepts. And as we place names on these concepts, then these names and these concepts will stay with us until such a time where there is a change. And this plays importantly into our understanding of how we interpret the Bible. You know, uh, Matt brought up several times that I would, uh, he, he brought up a, a suspect notion about a, a God who used languages that would die, but that is exactly what needed to happen in order for God's word to remain true throughout the ages. If he used a language that lived, then the language itself would be susceptible to change and therefore the concept would be susceptible to change. But because God chose to use dead languages, ancient Chaldean, which we call Biblical Hebrew, Aramaic, and Koine Greek, those are dead languages. Dialects still survive today, but the reason God chose to do that was so that the meanings could remain intact even throughout the ages. And if we understand why God chose Hebrew as opposed to every available language under the old system, then we're talking about the purpose of that language. When you look at that time and what God was trying to do with the Israelites, you understand that he was just introducing himself to the people as they were coming out of polytheism. In essence, God was attempting to lead these people by the hand, and so he chose a language conducive for word pictures and that showed a very personal side to himself. The Hebrew language is made up of only 600 root words. And from those 600 root words, which are three letters, and from those three letters you can build every other word in Hebrew, it's a very simple language, much like English, an SVO language, subject, verb, and object, but there he utilized that particular language because it painted pictures and it was a personal language. And God could utilize that particular language to accomplish his particular task. When you go over to the New Testament, the entire context changes. God's no longer trying to help people to understand some very profound concepts and showing them pictures as it were. This is what we do with children as they're growing up. We begin with pictures before we give them words. 
In the New Testament, God now shifts the context and now it's a series of arguments for God, for the church, for His Son, for the Holy Spirit, for truth. And so now He wants to give some very specific arguments and what language does He choose to use? It's the common language of the man, but it's also Greek because Greek is conducive for argument structures. Ever heard the phrase, that's all Greek to me? It's because the very nature of Greek, which is not an SVO language, it's a language that emphasizes word endings. God could utilize that language in such a way where he could construct arguments that would then ultimately prove his existence through a logical chain of reasoning. But to say that words have no meaning and that we don't know how we come up with meaning is to leave yourself open to many, many different possibilities and really no direction to go. This goes all the way back to wordsmiths such as Lewis Carroll and uh, Alice in Wonderland and through the looking glass. You remember the famous portion there in those uh, pieces of literature concerning Humpty Dumpty. And uh, I can't forget, or I can't remember now the word. He, she said, Philibelabber or something, Jabberwocky or some, some nonsense. And uh, it was Alice that was asking, well, what is the meaning of that word? And, and the response was, whatever I want it to mean. And if we live in a world where words are whatever we want it to mean, then anything is possible. But as we think about words, as we think about meaning, this is essential, if not paramount, to understanding God and to understanding why he gave us words, to understanding why the mind functions in the way that it does to understand language. And what's interesting is if you do a study into history, what is the common denominator of civilization? It's not that there were just human beings that learned to develop themselves socially. Sociality is based upon communication. Communication comes through language. In a very real sense, everything begins and ends with language. As a matter of fact, when God chose to create the universe, what did he use? What tool did he use? And God said, let there be thus and so. Language is all throughout the Bible. It's the very basis of human existence. And so as we think about civilizations and how they arose, they had to have the ability to communicate. They had to have a system to exchange ideas. And that's what created the environment for sociality. And that's what gave us civilizations. And when we figured out that we had to record our happenings for future generations, then language was transferred onto materials that could preserve this information for future generations. But language is all around us. As a matter of fact, even when we talk to ourselves, we're doing just that, talking to ourselves. So, real quickly, I won't take too much time. Um, I agree, language is critical. It's twas brilliant, the slightly toads of guy and gimbal in the wave, etc. Um, I'm not advocating that words can just mean whatever and still have value. You have to have this understanding in order uh, to communicate. You're, you're, your point about God needing to write in languages that die um, is interesting because it admits my point. You, your claim is that God needed to write in languages that die, so the meanings of those words or the usages of those words would stop changing, so we would have a reference point to go back and then look, which is an acknowledgement that the words themselves don't have an intrinsic meaning. They have a common usage, and we needed a point at which the change in that usage stopped in order to have a firm, fixed reference point. I, I'm, I'm fine with that. But it's an acknowledgment. My only contention was about whether or not words have meaning. Uh, they don't possess it intrinsically. We give them meaning. We have certain usages, and we can change that. Um, but also, when we go back to look at the Bible, and while I'm certainly not the language expert that you are with biblical languages, um, I do know that there is a large amount of contention about what specific words mean, even among the experts. 
because these languages have died off and they're not in common usage. And so it's what was that usage at the time that the author used it, this kind of, um, uh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the word wrong anyway, trying to figure out what the author meant and, and how that usage was. We have a better possibility if we know that a language stopped changing. But there are still many, many debates. I, would, I think you would agree that there's lots of debates about what these words mean. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the confusion we have. And I don't think the contention was on that aspect that you brought up, that uh, the intrinsic value of words and, and, and such, that was not the contention. I didn't dispute you on that. But I wanted to make sure that everybody understood that uh, once we ascribe meaning to words, then so long as those words have that meaning, then we honor that meaning of that word. Until we can show that within the context, a particular word is used in a different way. And that takes us into interpretation. I don't have a lot of time to talk about interpretation, but there are uh, systems of interpretation. We refer to it as hermeneutics, which is the science and art of interpretation. And this science and art is a system of how we interpret. That system is developed through scientific method, through observation and experimentation. But some, uh, just a very crude illustration, who, what, when, where, why, and sometimes how, is a basic system of interpretation that we ask any text that we're reading. Who wrote this? Why did they write it? When did they write it? To whom did they write it? How did they write it? And here we have interpretation at its very basic level. And this is something that is true for all rational beings. Now, when we argue about the particular sense of a word, context always takes precedence. Because context will help you to understand how a word is being used. And if we don't have the context, then we can make very quickly a text a pretext and we can make it mean whatever we want it to mean. So usually words appear in context. Contextus is the Latin that means to weave together. And we have to understand how a word is used by not only the immediate context, but by the remote context. But once we honor all those rules, we can come to a very specific and definite meaning. And that's what we do with the Bible. We understand the hermeneutic. We apply an accurate exegesis. And then we consider the context and we make sure that we understand and we compensate for the different uses of words. But once all that happens, you have what God wants you to have. I'm going to just summarize the question, uh, but basically the question is asking, is it not God's responsibility to reveal himself before I, in general, uh, can respond to him properly? Was that right? Through the Bible. Through the as evidence, okay? Well, that's the very premise of the Bible itself. It's the fact that God is revealing himself. As we go back to history and we understand what happened in ancient times, and as these things are recorded and then preserved for posterity, today in the 21st century, we can open this book, and this is not necessarily a historical book, not a scientific book, but it does deal with history. It does deal with science. It does deal with many other things. And as we look at this, we're going to see that there are certain arguments that are being made ultimately about God and why we should accept him. So that's the very purpose of the book. The very fact that we have this book is a demonstration that God is attempting to reveal himself. Now, I'm not certain if you're asking, must there be a personal experience? The Bible does not teach that we come to know God necessarily through a personal experience where God has to reveal himself through a miraculous means. He did that at one time under a different context, but now God reveals himself through his word. And God himself tells you why he has chosen to do that. And this was brought out in the last lecture before we entered into this discussion. Uh, Paul did not go by saying, I believe, I believe, nor did any of the other individuals. It had to happen through reason.
God wants to reason with you. He's not going to appear to you as he once did because he appeared to people for different purposes and different reasons. Those purposes and reasons no longer exist. Today, God understands that he needs information because we require information. The very thing that drives human existence is curiosity. And curiosity yearns for information. And we are our happiest when we're learning. Have you ever stopped to think about how everything that we do in some shape or form is learning? And then those times that we're not learning, we're resting. But our minds, our brains are programmed to just receive information. And as we are driving down the street, we're just inputting information, inputting information. And so God interjects his word in a system of information, which is the information that is supposed to help us to reason from the known to the unknown, which is God. Is there, is there time for me to touch on that? Yeah, yeah you go ahead. Right, it'll be, I'll, I'll try and keep it short because I'm sure you're all sick of me now, uh, or maybe both of us, who knows, uh, and it's hot. So if I have a history book and it makes 83 claims and I verify that 80 of them are correct, that doesn't tell me anything at all about whether the other three are correct, uh, even if they're all mundane claims. It tells me that the source may be somewhat reliable, but I can't actually verify those other three claims. And if, in fact, the 80 that we verified are rather mundane claims and the three that we haven't verified are extraordinary claims, well, then we're even more of a pickle. Now, what he just talked about was that God doesn't reveal himself in this particular way to people anymore. Uh, Church of Christ, as I understand it, is uh, miracles don't happen anymore. There was a time and a place and a reason for that, and that the reasons no longer exist. Um, and while I, you know, I don't want to don a Southern Baptist hat or anything, I'll just stay an atheist. Uh, there, I disagree. I think the reasons for that do still exist. The reasons for those demonstrations, from my perspective, is that that sort of demonstration gives a firm empirical footing to allow us to have a reasoned belief. That need still exists because absent that empirical demonstration, we are being asked to consider these other people's accounts trustworthy. And if they were just accounts of this happened, I'd say, okay, no big deal. But they're not just accounts of mundane events. These are the extraordinary claims that require extraordinary evidence. And I would argue, though it may offend people, that any God who thinks that they have a, a time period with a certain select group of people under which they need to establish firm empirical foundations for reasoned belief, and that that time ends and everybody who comes after that is now forced to rely on hearsay, doesn't understand the nature of evidence, reason, or the burden of proof. I just want to say something real quick. Seeing something does not necessarily mean that you're going to believe it. We have account upon account, and this was brought up in the last lecture. People in the Bible saw God, they heard God, and still rebelled against him. Still questioned whether he existed. It has nothing to do with empirical ev evidence per se. It has everything to do with a long argument wherein the conclusion makes a satisfactory answer that impels us to a certain way of life. And if you want empirical evidence, here it is. The Bible is an empirical fact. 